Hi, good morning, everybody. I see a lot of uh, familiar faces. Um, it's good to be here. And as Tanya said, I'm here to talk about OpenCL vectorization. OK, so first of all, let me talk a little bit about our team. Um, so I work for Intel, and my team is responsible for the OpenCL, OpenCL SDK. Um, and uh, so we develop the compiler for the OpenCL SDK, the debugger, and the runtime, everything, the profiler, everything that's, that's part of the SDK. The, uh, we have an offline compiler. Um, and the team is located in, in Haifa, Israel. And we're also responsible for um, improving LVM and supporting future Intel architectures. And it's a really small team, and we do everything. It's like a small startup within the company. And these are really exciting times to be in this team, because OpenCL is developing an LVM, and it's really fascinating to be in this team. And this is our product. This is the OpenCL SDK 1.5, and we support the 1.1 uh, 1 .1, 1 1 spec. Um, we support Windows 32, 64, and Linux 64. Uh, we have a unique implicit uh, vectorization module, which I'm going to discuss today. And um, it's available online for free. We have a nice website. You can go online and uh, download and play with it. It's a really good product. Uh, we're proud of it, so give it a try. Um, and this is one of the tools that comes with our SDK. This is called the Intel Offline Compiler. Uh, and in the box to the left, you can copy and paste OpenCL code and click Compile. And to the right, you'll see LVM IR. So you can look and see what's going on under the hood and try to optimize your code. Some people are more, feel more comfortable looking at LVM IR than assembly. Uh, we support both x86 assembly and LVM IR if you want to optimize your code. Um, so it's a really nice tool. And we have demos online on how to use this tool. If you click on the link later today, you'll, you'll see different videos. And it's a really nice tool. So um, as you can probably guess, our OpenCL compiler is based on LVM. We use LVM as our uh, compiler. So let me talk a little bit about OpenCL and what it is, really. Um, so op OpenCL is a framework. Um, it's a framework for, for programming GPUs, CPUs, uh, DSPs, and other acceleration devices. Um, so it's, some, it's, it's a unified um, programming language and a framework. Uh, it was, I think, it, I mean, it was proposed by Apple, and now it's controlled by Kronos, uh, which is the same organization which controls uh, OpenGL and other standards. Um, so it's an open standards with members from different companies in the industry: Intel, AMD, Qualcomm, Apple, of course. Um, the language itself uh, is similar to other data parallel languages, uh, similar to graphic shaders uh, that you may. Um, that com computer games use, such as you know, DirectX uses graphic shaders. But the language itself is a C-based language. Uh, it's based on C99. And uh, OpenCL calls the, uh, the shaders uh, compute kernels. Uh, and these compute kernels are C99-based. They have some restrictions. So for example, you can't use recursions in the 1.1 uh, spec. You can't, you can't use function pointers. And so, so you do have some restrictions, but you also have places where the uh, spec is extended. So for example, there's, there's new data types in the OpenCL language. Um, you have the uh, uh, float4, for example. This is a type that OpenCL has, which represents a vector of four floating point numbers. And you have other types, short2, and et cetera. And um, the OpenCL spec also defines a rich set of uh, library functions. Uh, so, for example, you have uh, the sine and cosine functions that you can also find in the C spec, but you also have sine4, um, which works on the float4 type, which means that, you know, it computes the four sine operations on each one of the elements in the vector. And, um, and the spec also defines the, the precision for each one of these functions. So it's a very verbose spec. And it's a very nice language. Uh, I mean. It's, it's, so it's very similar to uh, CUDA. If many, I mean, many of you are probably familiar with CUDA. OpenCL is very similar to CUDA. Um, so on, on the screen here, you can see OpenCL kernels. So to the left, you can see a regular C program, very simple. It, you know, it's a for loop. You go from 0 to n, and we multiply values from array A and array B. And um, this is, this is great for targeting CPUs, but, but if you want to target a GPU uh, and other devices, then you would need something else. Um, 
so data parallel languages um, kind of have this notion of this implicit outer loop. So basically, instead of writing a loop from, from zero to n, you write this kernel, this compute kernel, and instead of accessing the variable i, you access this function, get global id. And you actually specify the dimension here. You can have several dimensions. And then OpenCL defines this uh, um, uh, uh, partition of the, of the workspace. So let's say that we want to work between 0 and n. These are the different iterations that we execute. Um, so this is the workspace, and OpenCL kind of breaks it down to um, uh, work groups. Uh, CUDA calls it blocks. OpenCL calls it um, work groups. And, and each, each iteration in the original C code is called a work item. Uh, and each kernel works on a single work item. So instead of writing you know, the entire loop, you can just write A at ID times B at ID, where ID is the get global ID. Um, all right, so how do we vectorize it? Um, I think it's pretty obvious that we want to vectorize it in order to um, boost the performance of, of these workloads. So first, let's see how we execute it without vectorization. So. Um, Basically, the OpenCL runtime is responsible for executing uh, these compute kernels on each one of the work items. So, oh, and serially, I mean, you, you, ex you, you execute the work kernel on the iteration, on, on the first iteration, the second one, and et cetera, and so on. And, and basically, you just run the code, and it's really easy to implement. Um, but what we'd like to do is vectorize. And this is totally complete, completely different than um, out of vectorization of C++ programs. In C++ programs, you vectorize the innermost loop. In OpenCL, you do something completely different. In OpenCL and data parallel languages, you basically modify the kernel and you make it work on several work items at the same time. And then when you work on several work items at the same time, uh, hopefully, if your new kernel runs faster than the original or faster than processing several uh, um, work items one after the other, then you, you get an incre increased performance. Just because you need to execute the kernel less times. Now, let's look at it from another perspective. So we have the original kernel, and this is an LVM conference, so the first thing that we do is we convert it to LVMIR. And then we do something simple. We take the, uh, um, and by the way, this LVMIR can contain function calls, arithmetic operations, um, memory operations, load store, and all that, just standard LVM programs. And we widen each one of these instructions. So if we had uh, a scalar arithmetic operation, it will become a vector of operations, and we also rep need to replace uh, scalar functions with a vector equivalent. And once we do that, um, we can simply reduce the number of uh, iterations that we execute, and, and this is vectorization. So it's pretty simple. Um, something interesting to notice is that if we look at the SIMD vectors, notice that the first uh, um, cell in the vector would always execute uh, work item modulo vector size plus zero, plus one, plus two, et cetera, and so on. So, so it's very, I mean, you can look at the graphics from earlier and kind of visualize it. And um, this is how it looks from a, um, an LVMIR point of view. We just take a scalar instruction and we widen it to a wider uh, vector size. So this is vectorization of data parallel languages in general. Um, so let's talk about the OpenCL vectorizer. So uh, our product, the product that we ship, is the OpenCL SDK. And the vectorizer is one of the components within this uh, compiler. Um, so in, in this, in this uh, picture, you don't see the, op the whole, the entire OpenCL SDK, just the compiler component in this. Uh, and, and similar to a lot of other LVM-based compilers. So at first, you have Clang. And we took Clang, and we added uh, OpenCL support to Clang. Uh, a lot of the work was done uh, by changing header files. But we didn't need to change a lot of Clang itself in order to add OpenCL support. And, and then Clang generates LVMIR, and the LVMIR goes into LVM. And we, we run standard, the standard LVM optimizations. 
and, and we also have OpenCL specific optimizations and transformations. And the vectorizer is a set of passes, is a group of passes um, which, we, uh, which we use. Um, additionally, we, all, we have um, our built-in library, which is the, 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 the functions that I mentioned earlier, sine, cosine, cosine four, uh, which is a big bag of LVMIR um, that we have on, on the hard drive and then we load it, we link it, and finally we take this LVMIR and we pass it to the code generator and we use the uh, uh, LVM JIT to execute our code. Now, one thing that's interesting about the OpenCL vectorizer that it is not an OpenCL vectorizer. It is a general data, uh, data parallel languages vectorizer and OpenCL is only one of the clients, one of the users that it has. Um, so the Open CL, Intel's OpenCL SDK is one client. Uh, we also had an internal product, um, a DirectX product, which used the OpenCL vector, uh, um, which used the vectorizer to vectorize uh, uh, DirectX shaders. Uh, we also shared our vectorizer with uh, some of our partners. We also have other uh, unreleased products, and our vectorizer is also. Um, multi-target. It doesn't support. It's multi-language and also multi-target. Target independent. It, uh, it supports code generation for SSC4, uh, AVX, AVX, AVX2, and other Intel architectures. So it's very flexible. Um, now the way we achieve this flexibility is by hiding a lot of uh, of the different language and target information in separate analysis. So we have this language analysis pass that provides all, all the language details to LVM. So for example, the keyword that I showed you earlier, the get global ID, is unique to OpenCL. DirectX doesn't know what this function call means. And in DirectX, for example, you have the word sync, which, which is a synchronization um, mechanism. Um, and there are other keywords that DirectX has and that OpenCL doesn't have. And, uh, and also, each one of these languages have a rich set of built-ins that you need to convert, you need to widen. So sign becomes sign four. And DirectX has a different set of libraries. And so all of this is, is um, embedded inside this language analysis, which is used by the vectorizer uh, in order to separate the languages from the vectorizer itself. And LVM is, is a very flexible toolkit which allows us to do, to do all of that. Um, now, in the heart of the vectorizer, we have the packetization. And, and really, when you, th when you think about vectorizing, you think about packetizing. So you take a single element, scalar element, and you widen it. That, that's pretty simple, but, but it's not, because there's a lot of different details that you need to account for when you, when you actually packetize these things. So uh, the obvious thing, take scalar, turn it into a vector, no problem. Um, function calls, function calls could be very, Complicated. It's not really. It's not only you know. Look, go look in a table, find the equivalence function, widen it. You also need to take care of uh, calling conventions and and other problems, and uh, load store operations. Um, so the memory that we store or that we widen may be dependent on the index. Let's say we load a at i. Now we need to have very sophisticated analysis to try to detect whether the memory that we're loading uh, sits co consecutively in memory or, well, I mean, can we, can we issue a wide load or do we need to use a, a gather, scatter operations to access its, this memory? Um, so the, the packetization phase um, looks simple, but it's really uh, complex. Um, now, a lot of our users use vector instructions in the code. OpenCL supports float4 as an example to vector types and a lot of our users use um, vector uh, types. Um, now how do you vectorize vectors? You can't create a vector of vectors. So the thing, we do, the thing that we do is we scalarize the vectors and then we, we vectorize each one of the components. Um, and the idea is that um, Users who use vectors usually use short vectors. Uh, Intel AVX support eight wide vectors, uh, and so, uh, which doesn't really fit uh, a lot of uh, uh, programming domains. So for example, when you have color, you have four components, RGB and alpha. When you have coordinates, you have 
several components, and, and users write code for their, for their problem domain. And so, but we want to uh, make use of, of the wide vectors and kind of generate optimized code. So we advise our users, listen, if you want to use vectors, do it only because that's a problem you're trying to solve. Don't try to optimize uh, your code because we vectorize the code anyways and we're likely to generate better code, especially when considering future architectures. Uh, because porting vector code from one generation to the next is, is really complicated, usually. And by the way, this transformation is called AOS to SOA, um, at least for, for graphics, if you're in the domain of graphics. Um, now, packetization is, is, is not enough. You can't always just simply widen the instructions and expect everything to work. I mean, it'll work if you don't have control flow. Um, but a lot of times, different work items take different control flow paths. So you need to, um, to predicate or create masks in order to um, generate correct code. Because the second that all the work items take the same control flow, the same path, then you can, you can wind and everything and packetize it. But before, you need to flatten the control flow. Uh, so in the example here, you see that um, not all of the work items go the same path. If the index is greater than 17, then only then the, the value 7 will be written to memory. Um, and we also need to handle more complex control flow, while loops, and et cetera. Um, so predication comes before packetization. So the first step, the first thing that we do, and, and by the way, this is not LVMIR, but just, just an example. We, we actually uh, predicate LVMIR and, uh, and, and packetize LVMIR. Um, so the first thing we do is we, we enter, we, we calculate masks. So the condition that we had earlier, index greater than 17, becomes a Boolean a symbol bit, which, which, um, which tells us if we need to, or, or if the branch is taken or not. Then in the next line, we use it to uh, predicate the store that comes after it. So we have a masked store and we save the number seven to memory only if the condition is true. If the condition is false, then we don't do anything. And this code is correct. You can execute it and you'll get the same result as the original code. The next stage is to turn the predicate into a mask. So masked store becomes mask store four because it has, it has a four wide uh, uh, mask. So. So this is how the predication and, and uh, packetization works together. Um, now, it, it, it's not that simple. You don't just take every if and convert it to a mask because you have, um, s sometimes you have complex loops. Uh, now, for a simple loop that goes from 0 to 256 and, and all that, you're guaranteed that all the work items will enter together and leave together, but sometimes you have user code which uses the while. And in a while construct, all the work items enter together, but they leave at different times. And to account for that, you need to, to generate um, a loop mask. Um, so let's look at the loop mask. All the work items enter at the same time, and every time a work item leaves the loop, we need to change the loop mask. And all the instructions inside the loop need to operate using this mask. So if we have a load or store operation, uh, then it only, it only needs to happen if uh, the mask is active. And the same goes for values that are calculated inside the loop and are used outside of the loop and because uh, they need to be frozen at a certain iteration. So we need to account for that. And it adds complexity and overhead to to vectorization, but it's something that we need to do in order to achieve correctness of OpenCL uh, programs. Now, how do we mask, how do we predicate instructions? Um, so first of all, we need to predicate function calls for obvious reasons, because we don't want to call the function call if the, if, if the work item is, is not active. Uh, we also need to predicate loads and stores, because we don't want to store junk to memory or we don't want to load from an invalid page in memory um, because we may hit a segmentation fault. Um, and there are other instructions. For example, we can't divide by zero. We need to mask that. Uh, OpenCL runs with the uh, um, floating point exceptions disabled, so we don't need to 
actually predicate every single floating point instruction, but uh, we, we do need to predicate some um, instructions. And the LVMIR does not support predication, uh, which, uh, and, and we had to work with that. So uh, we basically implemented a, a very wide set of intrinsic functions for every load store operation, and, and we needed to write special code for widening these instructions and special code to add an, an addition argument to each function call, and we needed to teach you know, five different modules how to handle uh, the new call, and, and it's pretty complex from a software engineering point of view. But the idea is simple, just add a predicate to the instruction and it'll work. And also the analysis of predicate instructions is a little bit, a little bit more tricky. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, when you predicate, you take the control flow when you flatten it. So if you have an if statement, you, you execute both the then and the else side of the calculation. And, and one thing interesting is that if you have several work items that operate on this function, you have reduced vector utilization. So if you look at the example and if, if you look at the blue square, only one of the work items had actually executed the, the blue vector operation. Uh, one out of four. So um, it's not very efficient, but, but yet we did need to execute this. So we have reduced um, vector utilization and also when we vectorize, we need to calculate different masks and we need to store them in registers. So we have this, this overhead um, when we vectorize. Uh, so how do we, how do we handle this, this overhead? Um, so the way we handle this is by implementing a vectorization uh, heuristics, which decides what is the preferred vectorization width, vectorization factor. Uh, so we decide one, four, eight, or something else. Uh, one means don't vectorize, run the scalar code which could be faster in some cases. Imagine a very complex set of nested ifs, one instead of another if, instead of another if. Uh, the vectorization, the vector utilization at the end will be very low, so you don't want to vectorize in these cases. Um, but we also have other conditions uh, in which it's better to vectorize for size four or size eight. For example, if you're familiar with the AVX instruction set, it, 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 it mainly focuses on integers, I mean, I'm sorry, floating point operations. Integers are, su are supported by AVX2, but AVX1 focuses on floating point operations. And if you see that your kernel is dominated by um, uh, um, integer operations, then you're more likely to benefit from a vectorization factor of four because you don't need to take your big integer uh, vectors and then split them in half and then put them back together and then split them in half again. So uh, our heuristics decides that. And so the heuristics is a static uh, uh, analysis pass. We execute it in the beginning of the vectorizer. Kind of we gather different parameters and information, and, and then we make the decision of what's the vectorization factor that we want to use. And we tuned it using a, a very large number of OpenCL kernels. So it, it, the analysis is very, I mean, Developing the heuristics is very complex, but tuning it is, is really easy. I mean, you just take a bunch of workloads from, from clients and programs that you find online, and, and you run them as scalar and as vector with eight and vector eight with four, and then you simply try to pick the best version, make sure that the client code would run, would, would, I mean, that the heuristics would pick the fastest version of, of the three. Uh, now, vectorization itself is a really fast uh, pass. It doesn't take a lot of time to, to actually run it. Um, the, the build time is, is, not, is, is not significant, but what is significant is the code generation build time, which is increased dramatically. So first of all, in OpenCL, uh, the user may decide on the workgroup size relatively late in the compilation process. So we need to compile both the scalar and vector version and cogen both of them, uh, which doubles the compile time. And also vector code tends to be a little bit slower. And, and so, so the compile time obviously increases. Um, so we developed the OpenCL SDK, which is based on LVM. And we also interact and work with the community, which is beneficial for, for us and for the community. 
So let me start with a short story uh, about the vector select. So we have, in LVM, we have the select instruction. And until recently, LVM did not support the vector select variant of, of this instruction. So a select instruction is an instruction which selects between two values. In our case, uh, we have A and B, two different vectors. And then we have uh, the selector, which is a bit which is a vector of bits, and if the bit is one, you take the first one, if the bit is zero, you take the other one. And it's usually used together with the, uh, um, with the compare instruction. So you compare, then you select between two values. Um, and until recently, uh, LVM did not support the vector select, and so we had to implement this, this special pass to look at, to find uh, vector select instructions, because our vectorizer uh, and, and the, the Basically, the, the predicator generated a lot of masks, and we needed to use uh, vector select for these masks. Anyway, so we implemented our own path to find vector selects and replace them with intrinsics, and then we, had, we needed to add support for, for more and more instruction sets, AVX1, AVX2. And so that wasn't a clean solution, and we really wanted LVM to support vector select. And I was fortunate enough to work with Duncan Sands on actually resolving this problem within LVM, um, which I recommend. He's a busy person, but I do recommend working with him because um, he's wonderful. Um, so in this work, we added a new kind of uh, type localization. Type localization is, is the uh, phase in, the, in LVM which takes illegal types and converts it into legal types, which can, which can fit into physical registers. So in the example that you see right here, Let's take the, let, let's say that we have the original type four chars, four times I8. It obviously can't fit into a single register and you need to somehow legalize it. So the old way of doing things was to add more characters until you fill the register and the new way of doing things is to widen each one of the elements. And this, this is something that was needed for the implementation of vector select. Um, so it's now enabled in the LVM trunk. It didn't make it to the LVM 3.0 release, but if you go to the top of tree, then, then you can use it. And, and by the way, so once the vector promotion uh, um, was, was in place, on top of that, uh, I implemented the uh, uh, cogen support for AVX, SSE4, and, and I used the emulation for other targets using vector XOR and end. So, so now you, you can use that. Uh, now LVM is a wonderful uh, toolkit but it's not perfect and we want to make it better. And so here's, here's, the, uh, uh, here's our, a wish list of things that we want LVM to change. Uh, so the most important thing for us is the support of predicated instructions. We vectorize and we know that just by looking at, at the industry today, it seems like uh, more and more architectures are focused on vector uh, architectures and we'd like to support these architectures. And we'd like LVM to be able to support predicates and masks natively, um, which is something that we need to discuss as a community. Uh, something, something else is the support for Windows. Um, so a lot of times Windows is not supported as well as Mac and, and Linux. Um, and, and it's understandable. I mean, most of, most of the LVM users come from these two platforms. Um, but we, we, our product is, uh, or we, we do support Windows, and you know just the problems that we encountered is the c different calling convention and um, the MC infrastructure and the build system, and these are things that we that we had to fix locally. And um, backward compatibility of IR. So the OpenCL folks uh, um, propose uh, to use the open. The, they, they propose to use the, open C, the, the LVM IR as an intermediate IR for OpenCL. Um, and there's been some discussion in the mailing list about this. Uh, and in order to, to achieve the support, we'd like to work together with the community and kind of make LVM more portable so that we can actually build, uh, we can build on top of this IR. And once we do that, we'll need, we'll need to support different um, versions of the LVM IR, because the OpenCL spec will continue to move forward, and, and so is OpenCL and LVM, and we'll need to migrate easily between different versions of LVM. 
Um, now, we've been working with the community. We, we released some bug fixes and features to, to the open source. Um, now, we, we developed uh, AVX support internally based on LVM 2.8. Um, and other people developed AVX on top of the trunk, the LVM trunk, at the same time. But we needed to deliver a product, and we didn't know exactly when the, the work on AVX will be, will be finished, so we needed to develop our own AVX version, um, which is not the way to do things. So in the future, we're going to work closer with the community, and th this work had already begun with AVX2, and we're more involved, and, and also we're going to release, or started even to release our changes, or improvements to LVM's AVX, which, which came from our um, uh, um, branch. And just, just to give an example, Windows uh, calling convention for AVX and better shuffles and um, JIT support for, for uh, AVX are all, um, we started releasing these things. And in the future, we, we, intend to work, we, we intend to work closely with the LVM community to better support future Intel architectures and make sure that LVM has the best support for these architectures. Thank you, I'll take questions now. Okay. Uh, yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry? Can you help? No, I can't. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not familiar with the work. Well, for, first of all, I didn't hear the whole. Uh, I'm not familiar with this product, so I can't make the comparison. <coughs> Duncan. Yeah, how do you handle vectors of pointers? Vectors of pointers. Uh, we don't. We scalarize. <laughs> how do we handle vectors? How do we handle vectors of pointers? So we don't have a good solution for vectors of pointers. We do have ad hoc solutions in inside some built-in functions. So, for example, we can bitcast the pointer into I64 and, and use that. We also have other solutions. Uh, sometimes we detect that we access base pointer and offsets, and in that case, we abstract it using a function, and then we packetize this function or predicate this function. It's not clean, and we, we, it's something that we need to solve. Yes? Yes, it's in the product. We use uh, TBB thread building blocks to execute on multiple cores. Yeah. Can you talk about your vector instructions? What about the GPU? Do you do anything to compile the GPU? Um, I, I can talk about unreleased products. But <laughs> <laughs> We, uh, our vectorizer does not do anything in the area of reductions. No, <laughs> I don't. I mean, I mean, it's a good point. How do, how do you test it? How do you make sure that? Right, and I also understand that there's a contradiction in what I said. I mean, on one hand, I want the LVMIR to be stable. On the other hand, I want the LVMIR to support predicates, which it currently does not. So, yeah, I, I agree.
It's a good point. Thank you. Any other questions? All right. Thank you.